You're listening to Sarah Hagen Backstage, with interviews and insights from years inside the music industry. Join Sarah as she talks with masters of their crafts, finding out what makes them tick, both inside and outside of the music business. This week, Sarah talks with Mark Shepard. Welcome to Sarah Hagen Backstage. My guest today, Mark Shepard, is a studio and touring drummer, and he is also a well-known actor. Today, we are going to talk to Mark about getting his start in music, becoming an actor, getting and staying sober, and dealing with his anxiety on the road back to music. Stay tuned for an inside look into the life and career of Mark Shepard. Mark Shepard, welcome to Sarah Hagen Backstage. Thank you. Lovely to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. It's been forever, but it's so great to see you as well. And let's uh, let's hear how you've been. How, how has the last year been for you? Well, yeah, as you know, I, I predominantly in the last um, 20 years or so, I haven't been playing as much music as I have acting. So the impact of the pandemic on, on acting has been one thing. But uh, I did go back to touring in 2017, and I was actually looking forward to to, to being able to be out there and play the, these new gigs with some of my old friends. And it just, it tanked, it tanked everything. So, uh, you know, luckily I don't have to make my living that way, but uh, it must've been so scary. And it's so scary for a lot of my friends who, who just lost their entire live revenue for the last 12, 14 months. You know, it's Absolutely. just. Awful. Yeah. Our industry has, has had a, a really tough time of it and a tough time kind of making its way back. Um, we do see, you know, th- live gigs happening again and and recording and um, it's good to see our friends active again and our friends who are um, techs in the industry and stage hands and, you know, it's just um, tour managers. It seems like things are, things are starting back up again, which is a relief, um, but it's slow. So it, so it is, um, it, yeah, definitely to recognize that. It yeah, it's. I mean, it's for sure. And, we, switched, um, we switched from record sales in the '80s, being the the predominant, you know, record record sales and radio play. To now, we're in, obviously we're in streaming, and and the you know the deals that were done back in the time, which are, I frankly I think are atrocious with both industries. The deals that were done with streaming mm-hmm. were just insane, meaning that live performance was the the way to make your revenue. That was that was the way to go make your bread but like as soon as you take that away from us it's just a, it's a, a disaster and the other thing is some of the greatest venues that were there to play are, are just going to be gone i mean it's just not going to be happening when, when we come back to this which i think is so right. sad it is sad i think that um you know that's one of the toughest things because a lot of us as musicians we grew up going to those small clubs and that, those were our first experiences with live music so um you know to think about some of those being closed that's a hard hard thing to uh to swallow but um but yeah things are things are starting back up i see things here and there and i know i know you're experiencing that as well um i do want to talk about uh you said you started back up and playing music in 2017 and we're going to go back to the beginning and hear a little bit about your start in music but i have to i have to talk about our first connection when you called me back then years years back you were starting up playing music and i was working at zildjian and you were calling um to talk about getting some symbols and you left me a message and it was this really great message you know you, you let me know who you were and you know asked if i could give you a call back and it was the funniest phone call because i called you back and um you said the first thing you said to me was i don't know if you remember this but it was have you done googling me yet and (laughs) i just laughed because i got your message and the first thing i did was google you because you know you have to you have to know who you're talking to i recognized your name but when your face popped up then i was like oh yes he is the bad guy right (laughs) (laughs) That was the first thing that popped into my head and, um, you know, and you've done so much acting and, and, um, you know, so you've played so many amazing villainous characters that, um, I've never thought thought of them as villains myself. They have their own agenda. 
It's it's a weird. <laughs> thing. It's just I think it's because I'm foreign and I handle language reasonably well that that uh, uh, people can tend to put me in that position. But it's um, it has been a lot of fun doing what I'm doing. But my oh, first love is music, and it's always been music, and it, it, it's a really complicated story. It's a, and that's the reason why when I when I decided to go back to playing, uh, circumstances which I'll get to in a bit, which is just an amazing story. Uh, a group of friends of mine, a perfect opportunity, and ready-made gigging opportunities. So it was something mm -hmm. that I knew that I wasn't being rude by hitting up uh, the companies that I loved and have always used. I mean, I've never played anything Brazilians, you know, since I was 12, 13 years old. Mm -hmm. I've never, I actually, no, that's not true. There is one thing, and I have to hassle Jeff over this, is I know for a fact that Charlie Watts plays a, a flat old UFIP, which mm -hmm. is just wonderful garbage, and I had one. And I had <laughs> one in the 70s, and I lost it. I don't know where the hell it went. Oh no! It was just one of those perfect Charlie Watt symbols, and I was just like, I was always really happy about that. And then when I went, when I went to the factory behind you weren't there. I actually went to the factory without you on a mm -hmm. Friday. The offices were closed, so I had more fun than I was should have been allowed to have. So right. I'm going everywhere but the foundry. I was allowed, so that was that was perfect. But uh, to have to have Jeff and the and everybody else doing just going, oh no, no, you mean this symbol? And you, oh, you mean this symbol? And I'm yeah. like. Oh, God. And I said, I know you built them for Charlie, and I know he didn't take them, so I want one. One day, I want one of the flat <laughs> new copies because that's my dream symbol. But listen, yeah, yeah. This worked out. when I was about 12 years old, um, my dad was uh, renting a room from uh, 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 a lady who had two boys. One of the boys was a, a musical genius called Nick. Um, he had a lot of issues in his life, uh, which which stopped him from manifesting that musical genius. And his and his other brother, who was my friend, um, was older than me. It was Woody from Madness. So she was the floor manager of Top of the Pops, the British pop show. Mm -hmm. Their living room had literally twenty thousand vinyl LPs in it. Wow. And he had an old Ajax drum kit with a Beverly snare drum. And um, and he was going to he was going to trade. That was before he joined Madness. And he was going to get a new kit. So I bought that drum kit off him because I wanted to be just like him. He's a wonderful drummer. He's a lovely guy. Um, Daniel Woodgate is his real name. And um, I just wanted to copy him. And it just went this weird thing. I happened to be at school, and they they wanted me to do this sort of band thing. And I'm not good at that stuff. I don't read music particularly well even now. So I just started doing that and then i met a buddy of a buddy of mine and i ended up he lived in the attic of his of his parents giant old house and i ended up just moving in there instead of living at home and we started a band and then from wow. that his brother was new older musicians and i ended up connecting with a guy called dan tracy and he was in a band called the tv personalities the television personalities who were this really weird seminal slightly post-punk act signed to rough trade so uh, at 16 years old i went to make my first album with the tv personalities um on yeah an eight track it was an eight track i think it was at alaska the same place the soft boys recorded uh mm -hmm. uh i want to destroy you in that first underwater moonlight that album um but it was part of this thing and then you know i then suddenly i'm doing my first john peel session and i'm going to europe you know on a on a zero budget to open for theater of hate and nico Wow. So at, at 16 years old. So that was my start. And we were putting records out and then selling 40,000 albums on an indie label was a big deal. But selling it on a major label, it was a disaster because records cost, you know, 400 to a million to make. You know, it was insane. Mm -hmm. He never got to tour America unless he had a million dollars of tour support. So there was these things were all out of out of touch. So I was playing a lot of gigs in, in, in London and around. And, you know, I did a John Peel session, as I said, which is an extraordinary thing to have, have, have done when I was 16. And I remember mm -hmm. gathering, sitting around the radio and listening to it for the first time. It was a very different, it was a very big throwbacks thing. So we just kept making records and I kept making records with bands on Rough Trade. So I'd be asked to go play drums on this and go play drums on that. And frankly, I don't think I was very good, but I was part of a movement of making music that wasn't about being very good. It was about getting a message across and, and, and proving that you didn't need to to you know put orchestras behind everything you do but i was in bands 
that everybody else did covers of their songs and we influenced so many other bands. So with the TV personalities and, and I played with Jow Head and I played with Nicky Sudden who, you know, so we intersected with Johnny Thunders and all this. And then I joined the Barracudas and no, between that, I, I met Robin Hitchcock post, uh, mm-hmm. post um, Soft Boys at the Hope and Anchor. And I said, I want to play in your band. I think I was 16 and a half years old. And I went around his house and I played him my first album on his little mono player. And he's just the most lovely, strange human being I've ever known in my life. <laughs> and uh, it just turned into now I'm in his band. And unfortunately, I was playing with guys that were like top, top, top session guys like, you know, Matthew Seligman, that was the God rest him. He's, uh, you know, he played with, he, he started in the top, he started the Thompson Twins and then he left to go join Tom Dolby, play with Bowie at Live Aid, just beautiful bass player. Mm-hmm. He, Last almost exactly a year ago. Um, but there's a good story there as well. But um, so I played with him in 81, 82, and the band, some of the band just didn't think I was good enough. I didn't quite have that that edge, you know, for that that sort of that sort of thing. And I got pushed out and I was kind of devastated. It was a really weird thing. And uh, so I ended up joining the Barracudas and I toured with the Barracudas all over the world. And basically, you know, the first time I ever watched Spinal Tap, I didn't laugh because everything that could happen to that happened to me in the Barracudas and other bands. I was, <laughs> it's just an absolute fact. I mean, trying to find the stage to, you know, band members getting arrested before gig. No, no, just, no, uh, no self-combustion though, right? Oh, so that was the, actually somebody tried to find me to audition for that role when I was a kid. And there's this weird intersection with things that, People wow. wanted me to act when I was 17 years old. And I, I sort of got this weird, I have a weird anxiety thing. But but once I was turned down once, I came second to somebody very, very good who did a great film. I said, never again, I'm not doing that. So I shelved acting at 17 years old. Uh, I, I didn't go to drama school. I didn't do any of those things. So I, I'm a drummer. I play drums. That's what mm-hmm. I do. So I just kept playing. And, you know, after the Barracudas, I moved to Ireland and played with a band called Light a Big Fire. I uh, opened the Joshua Tree Tour. You know, we were probably us and the Hot House Flowers were the other two big bands in Ireland at the time. My wife just found me the bus poster, which I have over here. Oh, how cool is that? Opening day of the Joshua Tree Tour. So That's it's, you know, incredible. I didn't know you were on that tour. That's amazing. I opened that show. I was in the mm-hmm. first. I was the first act that played at Croke Park, which was, you know, my extended family, all my family's Irish. Mm-hmm. So my extended family, you know, it was, it was an event. It was an absolutely huge event. You can imagine in Ireland that the, the biggest stadium that you have in Ireland um, and, you know, the, the heroes coming home and, and playing for the first time, what we've been listening to on the radio for this time. We opened it and it was an amazing experience. And I, yeah, my wife just got me the post. Some guy kept it and I, I have the tickets and a t-shirt, a cut off cap sleeve t-shirt. Yeah, that's such a sweet <laughs> gift. How thoughtful. She, she, she's bought me incredible gifts. Um, but here's the thing. So I'm going to get through this because it takes a little while, but it's, it's so much fun. Uh, my problem being is my anxiety and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, and I, I seem to be wired a little different. And uh, I got heavily into drug use. I ended up playing in, in the London Cowboys and bands that were more famous for heroin abuse than they were for, for actually making records. So um, by the time from about 17 to 21, 22, 23, I'd, I'd switched to alcohol because I couldn't do drugs anymore. And I was I was genuinely a full-blown alcoholic in my very early 20s. And this sort of hampered the things I want to do. And, 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 and you know, I was signed to major labels. I, I, I came out to America. My dad was doing Max Hedrum out here, playing Blank Reg on Max Hedrum. And I came out here and I, at one time to visit, and I was like, I want to live here. And my band knew I was going to quit and move here. They just knew it. Mm-hmm. So I left my 20... 12, 14, Gretsch, Walnut kit behind, which I had had since I worked at the London Drum Centre, which I forgot when I was 12 oh, wow. or years old uh, back in the day. I think those guys were bigger weed dealers than they were drum <laughs> centre. Uh, but I worked in a drum shop. And it, uh, again, the intimidation factor. This is really important. It's the intimidation mm-hmm. factor. You're working in a drum shop at 12 or 13 years old. Mm-hmm. And there was... Uh, just this fear, this massive fear, because, you know, Pierre Moulin would come in or, or, or you know, Cobham would come in and they'd mm-hmm. tap 
I would. It's like you know, you go to you, you go to guitar center and everybody grabs a practice pad and tries out sticks. I wouldn't do it in front of anybody. I was really uncomfortable about the idea mm -hmm. of, of of people seeing my limitations. But right. I just kept making records. I made like thirty albums at that point. It was like insane, and uh, you know, and it's, it's funny because like when I talk, you know, you know Ash Sohn well. Mm -hmm. Ash know each other, but never really knew each other. Mm -hmm. We fought to meet at the Zildjian Live. We had never met, which is insane. And David, who plays with uh, uh, Rod Stewart, I know, and I know all those guys. And it's this this weird thing. I think Jed Lynch has it as well. It's this sort of you're not allowed to be flash in England. You're not allowed to be a chops guy. It's just not mm -hmm. that like, we get terrified. When Don when Don came to me and said, "So you're going to come and do a, a a video for us?" I'm like, "God no!" Every time I see one of those videos, I have to go home and practice. He goes, "They." <laughs> They all say that everybody is free. Even Aaron Spears is freaking out at having to mm -hmm. do a presentation. But it, you know, it is kind of like the gunslinger territory of, of, of you know, signed drummers are like who's got the best chops, and that's why I loved what happened with Zildjian and, the, and I'm digressing. But that's why I loved why Zildjian Live went that way, mm -hmm. and it's not being about who has the most interesting solo to where do you put it into Ghost Note into Spot stuff. You know, giving it that that whole. Um, snarky puppy vibe which is what you really needed to show these inc incredible drummers and what's right. fascinating to me is the ash stones of the world you know the, the phil the no phil phil which has now gone down in history which i was <laughs> yeah. eight feet from him when he did it the scream we let out when he just didn't play something it was the most right. thing. and I, I never knew that that's what i loved about drumming why did i love charlie watts why was mm -hmm. i never buddy rich fan although i appreciate him a lot why do i like krupa more why do i you know why is tony williams something so special to me you know why but i, I grew up listening to r b and and, and what was mm -hmm. essentially in america was called black music but it was just it was unobtainable music for most people in england and you know everything was defined it was it was cultural and it was by lines if you were this you listen to this you dressed like this if you were this you listen to that you dress like that you know yeah. if you for that or whatever yeah ash stone actually ash spoke to that um when i spoke with him a couple of weeks back he was he said the same thing it was very genre defined so you played one genre right and it wasn't yeah. like you were really allowed to get out of that box your haircut um, your haircut had to match right. the i mean so we in america is a different thing because the showmanship in america was a a totally different thing and the bands that made it really big in england were the ones that knew how to show like american bands mm their own identity so you know you get oasis which is a you know a pattern off the who and a bit of the beatles but i know for a fact because uh alan mcgee who signed oasis wrote the liner notes to two of my records on rough trade mm. he was just, he used to follow around the tv personalities and he ended up being signing th then the biggest band in the world anyway digressing through all this stuff so drug use alcohol use disaster it just doesn't mm. i got to the stage where i moved over here and my dad was teaching acting and he had a kid there called andres jones and he had a friend called josh clayton felt josh clayton felt was 17 years old they took me to raji's which was the only place in la they could get me into because they were underage and i wasn't i was like 21 22 or something may have been a little old i can never i can't remember a lot of this so maybe 23 24. and i realized how brilliant josh was and it ended up and we found this guitarist called mike who was at, at GIT at the time and put a, together a band called School of Fish. So I played on all the demos and all the early stuff of School of Fish. And at the same time, I kicked back into acting. Mm. It's weird thing. So I, I recorded with Jeff Eirich called me into the guy who produced the Plymouth Souls called me in to play with Donnie Nossoff, the ba wonderful bass player. And he and I sort of became this rhythm section, but I was too messed up to actually be able to to, to be consistent and play. So I was offered all these auditions for like huge bands because I'm interesting and I'm a good timekeeper, I guess. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I, was I was terrified. I couldn't do it. Like, I backed out of a cult audition. I backed out of like two oh, or wow. three auditions. Remember the graces, a bunch of stuff. And people always try to help me. Tony Thompson. Uh, I got together with Tony Thompson and I used to go to his public storage unit down on Jefferson by the airport. And we just used to play all day and he got me a kit from pearl and he was i remember him lamenting that gretch wouldn't endorse him at the time if he couldn't do anything to get free gretch or get any sort of which he always wanted gretch he didn't have it so i have one of tony's snare drums and 
he's uh, unfortunately gone. What a wonderful man he was. He was so good mm-hmm. to me. But, you know, yet again, the, the, the rigors of, of, of drugs and a hard life can really knock you sideways. You know? But I got so, so I got sober and I was running a bar. I took a straight job, which is weird. And then just yeah. everybody thought I was a pathological liar because I'm going, oh, yeah, I'm talking with you too. And like, they just literally thought I was a pathological liar. You know, I did this, I did that and whatever, you know. It's like, and then I, nah, he's, and then, you know, I did this play and this play got, I'm the front page of the calendar and uh, I got drama critic circle awards and all this stuff. And these people are like, we're so sorry. We just thought you were crazy. <laughs> I remember the distinct thing is I have the article in one of my bathrooms and it says, actually I get to say one of my bathrooms. My God, that's so trite. Um, but I get to say, I'm not an act. I'm not, uh, I'm not an actor. My dad's an actor. I'm a musician. So there was all wanting to play and this massive disappointment. And then, you know, knowing I went out in front of a hundred thousand people effed up, truly effed up. And mm-hmm. that one side of a very sort of Phil Seaman sort of vibe of feeling one side of my body was out of sync with the other. I mean, just massive anxiety problems, none of which make playing music fun. Mm, right. But I, I loved it. And then I'm doing all this stuff. So, Fast forward, there's lots of other bits in between, lots of other weird stuff in between. So I'm running a bar. I got sober. Greatest thing ever happened to me. I got sober. I'm now 31 years sober, which is oh, insane. I'm congratulations. 50, thank you. I'm 56 years old and 31 years sober, and it's a magical thing. Um, but I didn't play. I couldn't play sober. I was terrified. So I got a straight job. Ended up getting canned from that to, uh, while doing this play. Uh, and then I went back and I did in the name of the father and I did all those things and I started Mm -hmm. on American television and it was just like so much fun. I had this massively interesting career, but I wouldn't play drums. I produced a couple of things, but I I wouldn't, I actually got Chad Smith to play on something I produced rather than play it myself. It was, I mean, Chad's brilliant, but I was doing this thing with Kristen Vigard and he, and he, uh, it was just brilliant. It was, but I was terrified of playing. And so cut a long story short, Supernatural years later, massive show, massive crowds, massive conventions. So this is why. So these and that there was a band that's associated one of, with one of the actors that was on Supernatural quite a lot towards the end, and it was a a, a twenty year veteran LA band called Loud and Swain, named after I think Ethan Hawke's character in one of those movies. I can never remember it, um, but they were really good. And the trouble with the convention was is they had you know, like vocal PAs so people could do guest talks and they brought the band and they paid the band to be there. It ended up being like a wedding band. And I'm watching these guys and this massive talent. I mean, absolutely massively talented band. I'm like, they all went, you know, the drummer went to um, same place as he was like Blair's buddy at, at uh, wherever they, where did they go? North, North, Texas? North Texas? Yeah. Yeah. Is it, I mean, massive pedigree. Like, you know, everybody played five instruments. And I'm looking at this, and they're, they're looking, being made to look like idiots. And they said, and one day they said, will you come up and play? And I, I was like, yeah, all right, whatever. And there's a video of it. It's me trying to play back in black with people, and I can't hear anything. And they're like, I oh, it. it's good. Like, oh, you play? I'm like, well, yeah, of course I play. I've always played. I've played since I was 12. And they're like, oh, but you play, play. I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, you don't forget how to play. It's like, it's, you know, what I love doing. So, you know, I think he started a little fast. So, you know, I was like, fine, I'll play at his tempo rather than bossing him around. And then it suddenly became this thing and then it became this bigger thing. And then it ends up as a 53 foot truck and full PA. And what I did is I went to the people that I've always loved and said, look, there's a big opportunity here for me because I've got millions of followers and we're actually doing something. Mm-hmm. You know, you have the best products in the in, in the in the land. I, are you interested in supporting me? And and I think my passion was infectious somewhat. And, Absolutely. You know, and I'm I'm honoured, honoured, to be a part of the Zildjian family, as we say, even the supernatural family. Because I mean, I wouldn't play anything else if I, even if I didn't know Kirsten and I didn't know you, and it wasn't this wonderful ongoing relationship which I love. I mean. I'm a I'm a Remo artist and I'm a I'm a DW artist and I'm god damn it I'm a Fender artist by the most bizarre thing you can imagine. Uh, you know, I represent I try to represent. I don't represent. I try to represent and put forward my love for the the only products I would ever use. So, you know, Vic, I have drumsticks with my name on them from Vic. I mean, I'm like it blows my mind that I could even do that. 
but the, the, the people involved, it hasn't changed. It, it, it was such a corporate world and was such a massively corporate thing that a lot of the personalities disappeared. And yeah. well, Mark, you know, I just, just to say you, not just your um, influence and your reach, but you are a fantastic drummer in your own right. And I know you play that down a little bit, but you, you're who I would call like a pocket drummer. And, and it's funny that you mentioned that video, the back in black video, because I did see that and that you mentioned it started off a little fast because you you pulled it back and you could hear that in that, Crying, in that video. Yeah, and you were and it's great. And you really like you're you're just such a pocket drummer like that. And you know There's a lot more stuff out there where you can actually see me playing properly. There's, yes, yeah. We'll set we'll put some links in the description for sure so people can a, see. Fun um, thing they recorded it's, to to cut back to the fun part, I'll just end this quickly. So I the things with Loudon Swain and whatever, it turned into basically like Levon's Saturday night special thing. It, it turned into this massive gig and we could bring people in to sing and it be, just be, it became huge and it was really, mm -hmm. really massive. And then Robin Hitchcock called me and Robin yeah. was like, um, hey, you want to go play the Troubadour, go do some NPR radio stuff and uh, go on tour? I'm like, yep. So I was actually at the Grand Old Opry or the Opryland Hotel, not the, I wasn't playing the Opry, we were playing the giant hotel, mm -hmm. Twain, doing my bits and pieces. I mean, it's their band. I just used to do two drummers just to make it fun. So if you look at the Remo stuff, that's me and Stephen, um, wonderful Stephen Norton, great drummer. Mm -hmm. Us playing Whipping Post with no music, which is really funny. Um, so my guys gave got, got me a truck, put my flight cases in with my massive size touring drums. So I've got a, you know, uh, a 22 20 so it's, uh, we go the other way around in numbers so 22 mm -hmm. 20 14 14 12 16 16 uh six and uh eight, i think it was i think it's an 1818 mm -hmm. it's an 1818 so this is my kit and robin and i went into sir on our own just he and i and played for a day and I didn't know what he was trying to do, if he was auditioning me again or what he was doing. I'm, I'm like, this massive, I'm like, I'm so sorry I have this large kit, but that's all I've got here. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, it's okay. And he goes, do you know, do you remember blah, blah, blah? And I, I know 40 years of his catalog. I know his entire catalog. It's just I always have. And I have that kind of weird memory, you know? Mm -hmm. And what I didn't realize, he wasn't auditioning me. He just hadn't played electric guitar in so long. Mm. He wasn't remember it because he was going to have to do something with Yola Tengo. And he put this band together and I'm flying around the world doing conventions. So I flew back from Paris, landed, went into a rehearsal room, Luther Russell, Tony Buchan, myself, and put down 40 years of music. And that turned into selling out the Troubadour. Um, my dad saw my last gig with, with my dad has passed a, uh, a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. but he saw my last gig with Robin at the venue in Victoria in London. And oh. he saw my first gig with Robin at the, uh, uh, at the Troubadour where we sold out and it was just magic and we recorded it and there's so much positive stuff going on and I loved it and if you look at the pictures the stuff I did for Modern Drummer and, mm -hmm. and a great friend of mine Michelle um, he was a wonderful photographer all the stuff that went to, to Zildjian all the stuff all those photos of me just smiling and laughing my ass off because it's my joy you know and I'm playing and I'm playing a song by Soft Boys called Underwater Moonlight which is just 30 seconds on a hi-hat for an entire song and it's mm -hmm. insane insanely jealous and there's my son on my left just like pumping his fist going, and i'm watching the blisters coming up on my hands as I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going i haven't put my body through this in so long but the joy i swear to god sarah the joy was absolute and then i got to play with luther russell we you know we played with the psych psychedelic furs at the fillmore who the hell gets to play the fillmore when you come from finchley you know what i mean it's amazing. And World Cafe and all those. And they're all recorded. And they're all really good. The World Cafe sessions for him were great. Then we went over to England, played all the gigs I played 35 years before. Mm -hmm. And Mark Riley's BBC Six radio session is one of my favorite things we ever did. So I did a lot of live stuff. You want to hear me playing, that's me playing. and that's that. But I'm mimicking eight eight different drummers that he had, basically. Mm -hmm. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something about, nice about Kirsten before you ask me a question. Last thing I'll tell you. Kirsten, you actually told me on the phone, bring it back to the first conversation. You said, well, I'm East Coast and Kirsten's West Coast, and you have to know that. So I called Kirsten, and I told her who I was. And she goes, I don't watch television. I've got, I've got a bucket of kids. Or if you're, <laughs> you're not on Nickelodeon, I haven't seen you. I said, well, I was the drummer in 
in uh, in School of Fish. She goes, oh, yeah, I dated the guy after you that was in that band. <laughs> I was like, oh, cool. She goes, yeah, you, you, you paid your dues. I remember you playing back then. I'm like, going, oh, my God. So right. there's a disconnect between I'm a drummer and a, a, I'm an actor. And she's just the most fabulous person. She pretends she doesn't play drums. She pretends that, which I love in her Gumby kit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get to go over there. You're not allowed to touch the symbols. You're not allowed to open any of the cabinets. You're not allowed to touch mm -hmm. anything. You can talk to her and she'll go into the, the secret cabinet and pull something out and put it <laughs> in the and you get to play it. I literally walked in. I'm playing Robin Hitchcock, a song called America, which he recorded with Steve Hillage in like 1980. Mm -hmm. And it goes, and there's a bish in it. Mm -hmm. And it's iconic. Yes. So, I went, so I literally went to her and I went, listen to that. I said, you got a symbol does that? And she goes, yep. Pulls out a, <laughs> pulls out a case, tr special dry, mm -hmm. round, which I hadn't seen the round at the time. Remember the weird, the, but, but the holes were different. Oh, yes. Having yes. the long slots, it had the round slot. It had the round exactly. holes. And I literally hit it, and it was the same note. I literally laughed my butt off. She knows so much about symbols. Yes. And then, and, you know, go further than that, then I get to go to Zildjian one day in my life and walk around there. And I watched Jeff hitting a cymbal the same time, same way, mm. with stroke every time. And he's going, and I'm kind of, he goes, you want me to teach you why you like what you like? <laughs> like Please. Because yeah. you try to describe symbols to people and it's like, you know. Uh, you it's don't a language, right? It's a whole language in itself with all these words that, just apply. It's like, what's your favorite symbol? I said, 19 inch Constantinople. I mean, there is, it's just the most beautiful crash ever. No matter what setup I've had, and I've got, I've got a lot of zillions, I don't have too many, but I've got a lot of zillions. Mm -hmm. And I do it on if, it's, if the opportunity is perfect and, and it's required for somebody to have a symbol that wouldn't be getting a symbol, they're going to get to play mm -hmm. it as far as I'm concerned. So that, that K, that K goes on the right of a K dark dark 18 and 19 i used to play 16s and stuff back in obviously in the 80s we had small symbols and now it's like i've got big now right 19s it's like yeah. whoa <laughs> <laughs> so this thing is just beautiful it's my second symbol so it's number two it's a psh, and it just sounds right and he goes i'll tell you why and it explains to me the tones that i'm hearing mm -hmm. I'm like ah oh. i guess you know, it's like going to the remo factory and you go like i thought they were all made by fairies in in china or, or <laughs> somewhere in the middle of nowhere and it's like no they've been making it here like this the same way for yes. amount of years as right. you're walking around louis belson's drum cases you're like what? i know and it's it is something so amazing about this industry that has this this history associated with it it's just it's just so you feel it you know when this is your passion and i can see it and i heard your passion that first day on the phone with you you know you can tell you can tell when someone's really sincere about it and really into it and you know you it must have felt amazing to come full circle and be back with robin it after was magical. that experience it was yeah. magical it was truly magical and had my family see me do that mm -hmm. go, oh there's a happy place yeah you know, life is tough enough as it is and then you know being able to go do it and i can stay in decent hotels yeah, and yes. <laughs> i'm not in a transit van you know, if you know a British tour, your transit van was the, I remember I bought a transit van for 50 quid. My dad was driving to a TV personalities gig, must've been 17. And he crashed it in a gas station. Oh no. He has 300 quid to fix the other car. Oh so, no. But it's 50, it was, it, all of these, I've got spinal tap stories that would just curl your eyebrows. Just the, I love it. but well, it's, but the joy of it is, is going out there to a live audience, which I love in any, Circumstance and telling a story, and that's the best of music. That's the best of, that's the best of any performance. That's the joy is the audience. It's you know, doing it on Zoom might be fun, but the mm -hmm. when, you, when they breathe, you breathe. When you know, and having Larry Mullen turn around to me, I was like, Larry's kind of like, he's, he, I said, well, he goes, what what wedges are they giving you? And I said, they give me that. He goes, that's crap. I'll get the fifty one sixty. So he brought, he brought out two K fallback for me to play on the on the stage. I was like, thanks. He's like, yeah, because this is before in ears. We weren't using right. in ears. And that was the other change in my life. Jerry Harvey, my God, changed my life completely. I could turn everything mm -hmm. around and actually hear it. But the gag was like, he goes, remember, you know, I played to like 30,000 or so. It headlined to 30,000, but hadn't played on people ever. And he goes, when they start clapping, you're screwed. 
I'm like, he wow. goes, yeah, because they don't clap in time. No, they don't. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, and they. It's, a, it's suddenly the out. You look out, and you look left, and you look center, and you look right, because your eyes don't have enough scope to cover that much audience. Mm. You're like, wow, and you hit a snare drum, and there's that Pretenders song, which has the bridge in the middle, so the way she goes, like walking on stage, you know, crack. And I hit my snare drum and I know my aunt could hear it three and a half miles away in our house. It's Amazing. just it's the greatest. And I don't care. And, and playing, you know, playing the troubadour is great, but I, I've played, you know, the hope and anchor and, 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 and the moonlight club. And I played the, the rock garden, Covent garden to 14 people. And still mm -hmm. it makes no difference. Yeah. But the biggest thing for me is the community, which I've discovered. Mm -hmm the drummers you know and love and have great relationships with and i'm beginning to learn and, and know these people some of whom were were like heroes of mine absolutely heroes of mine just fantastic players and they're also nice because they're yes. you know it's it's like it's just such an amazing group of people it is and it, and, it, and so so much support of each other you know and i i think it's unlike anything else and you know being in this industry for for the time that I've been here, I get the question from people and they say, oh, tell me about a terrible experience. I don't know why people want to hear about the negative. Tell me about someone who is really difficult to deal with. And it's it's so rare. It's so it just doesn't happen because we are a community of people who really care about each other and are supportive of each other. Um, it's like punching air. when you start behaving like that it's like punching air because uh, we we know it we've all been through it anybody over the age of 50 is, has definitely been through the 80s you know so somebody behaving badly with substance abuse or mental health issues mm -hmm. you kind of go yeah got it you know yeah, we'll, right. we'll just ignore them for a week or two and they'll be okay well right right <laughs> and how how did it um you know performing now and being sober how does that feel different for you and how does the anxiety work itself out for you it's terrifying yeah it's truly terrifying for me because i still have that you know 17 year old kid that doesn't feel good enough and you know I, it just takes 10 seconds for me to watch you know oh god watching gogo playing playing on the zildjian stuff i mean yeah, i mean dennis was there and there's so many amazing people there but just mm -hmm. to play and go my god you're a monster mm -hmm. you're monster and you carry that in you go maybe i need to practice playing in fives a little more yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah we're talking about girl who... can I play a six stroke role so i worked out how to play a six stroke role i mean yeah. i fell in love with the purdy shuffle always did but i never played it so when i came back to drumming um i worked out the purdy shuffle but i worked it out backwards okay so i was but i was I was actually literally playing it with a with an inverted hi hat, so that you know the 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 first the first beat was wrong. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly complicated for myself so often, and then it was like somebody somebody in the community go, if you're brave enough to ask, and you go, how do you do that? They'll go, oh great, it's, but you're like, oh my god, it's so easy. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and, and it is. It is this community where people are willing to share and teach and help and you know be there for each other. Um, it is it is pretty amazing. Um, I, I, I urge anyone if they ever come to LA to go to uh, Pro Drum in Hollywood and yeah. see the history of LA drumming. I mean, that's literally not the birthplace, but it is the cornerstone of everything. Mm -hmm. and if you're good at tuning a drum, and you're in LA, go in there. Stan or Jerry will take care of you. It's yeah. just one of those things. And if you're missing a lug from a 1954 you know, weird Zildjian kit or, you know, a weird old lady kit. They've got it. They've got mm -hmm. it somewhere in a box. It's like the best place I've ever, best place I've ever seen. So. Um, it is amazing. That's um, it, is. it is support because we're, we're the non-mobile members of bands. We're the guys that have to have the machinery. We're the guys that have to lug the stuff up and down and, 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 and get it, uh, get it all to work. But, you know, we're, we're sitting targets as well. We're yeah. definitely. In targets i've had more gags played on me by bands flat <laughs> space shuttles into my head from long distance on a wire oh I once, I once i was in a barracudas gig and i was in a, a wherever my riser was it was really low above my head i think i was like if i stood up i could almost hit the, the ceiling of my head so mm -hmm. i'm like 
back then I weighed like 130 pounds. And so shirt off, I'm wearing leather motorcycle pants, motorcycle boots, playing with like basically surf punk music. And I was looking up and there's these egg crates on the ceiling, like literal egg crates on the ceiling, the big ones. Uh -huh. Bits of gaffer tape all over the thing, right? It's bits of duct tape everywhere. And the lights weren't pointing on me from the floor. The pots were going at the ceiling. And so I kept looking at this and what's going on, I'm playing. And the next thing I know, all the egg crates fell on top of me and it was about four pounds of flour in the egg. <laughs> and I was very sweaty at that point. So I just literally <laughs> turned into an instant ghost. But they had pointed it at the things and were waiting for it to melt the glue. Oh was, my gosh. Yeah, we're sitting targets. It was wonderful. That's elaborate. That's an elaborate scheme. Elaborate. <laughs> end, end, of tour, end of tour pranks. Oh, well, with a couple minutes we have left, um, let us know what, what you're up to now or, or what you have planned for the future. I know things are things are still up in the air, but is there anything we can look for with you? Oh, I've, 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 uh, I may or may not have just completed work on not saying that i have but not saying that i haven't completed work on part of season three of doom patrol on hbo which i love that show it shows Fantastic. amazing it's such a great show um it is the the most anarchically strange uncomfortable mental health exploration i've ever seen in my life <laughs> and if you, if you don't know it is brendan fraser and and, mm -hmm. uh, and diane guerrero it's, it's on it, HBO Max, is that right? It's moved to HBO Max, which is wonderful. Yeah. I, I urge anybody to see it. I love it. I'm actually playing Constantine, effectively, because Grant Morrison wasn't allowed to put Constantine in the comics. But blah, 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 blah. anyway, that's <laughs> fun. And I just I just completed a, a, a very interesting video game, which in the next couple of days I'm going to be saying that I've actually been in it. So that's kind of cool. Super um, cool. Yeah, and I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for my friends to be able to go out and play and somebody go, you know what, Mark might be fun to do this. So It'll I'm happen. Absolutely. I'm hoping so. We need to do a part two where you get to ask me questions instead of me giving you speeches. <laughs> Let's do a part two for sure, because I have a million questions for you. I will answer them all, I promise. Okay, we'll do it. But thank you so much for being here today and letting us know how everything progressed for you through your career. Do, um, not, do, not, do not forget how special you are and how important you have been in, in the community and within Zildjian. And, and, and on and all the other things that you do but it is Thank you. you should hear the way that zildjian artists talk about you it's a wonderful, wonderful thing and you are a, a cornerstone in a, in an industry which is becoming extraordinarily corporate and you are you are a very very important part and the jeffs and the leons and everybody else that that i have been lucky enough to meet and see and david and all those guys they're just you know it, 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 with the last great analog instrument with the last great analog instrument. And uh, thank you for being such a wonderful part of that. I really appreciate you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much, Mark. It means the world to me. And um, we will see each other in person again, I'm sure. Really? Um, but stay tuned for part two, because we're going to do it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for tuning in today. Join us each Tuesday for new episodes of Sarah Hagen Backstage.